when a young woman went missing while out for a morning jog. Her case made international headlines and quickly became known as Salt Lake City's most high-profile disappearance. Still, no one could have imagined the series of baffling lies that were discovered during the search for her, exposing years of secrets and a dark double life. On the morning of July 19, 2004, 28-year-old Mark Hacking woke up to find that his wife, Lori Soares Hacking, had already gone to work at Wells Fargo, where she was a stockbroker's assistant. Lori had planned to wake up around 5 a.m. that morning and head out for a run, as she often did in the Memory Grove area of Salt Lake City, Utah. She was then going to return home, get ready for the day, and Mark was going to drive her to work at 7 a.m. However, when Mark woke at 8, after accidentally sleeping in, he just assumed Lori had come home and driven herself to work without waking him. This suspicion was confirmed when he noted that her vehicle was gone. Not thinking much of it, Mark continued with his morning like usual. That is, until around 10 when Mark called her work and he realized she had never arrived. It was only then that he noticed the clothes Lori had laid out to wear to work were still at home. In fact, he was on the phone with Lori's co-worker when he made the discovery, saying, Oh my heck, here's her clothes. She never came back from running. Thoroughly concerned, Mark then called 911 just after 10 a.m., The desk sergeant he spoke to told him that he had to wait 24 hours to report Lori as a missing person. Assuming there wouldn't be much help from the police, he then headed for Memory Grove and found Lori's car where it was still parked in the area she usually left it while running. But there was no sign of his wife anywhere nearby, and her car appeared to be undisturbed. Soon, Lori's co-workers arrived to help in the search for her, and many of them had also called the police to report her missing. They were joined by both Mark and Lori's family members. Lori usually ran a set route, and her loved ones were already checking the trail she followed when the police arrived on the scene. They told officers that Lori always ran along the roadway when she was alone, and only veered off this path if she had a companion for safety. When officers interviewed Mark, they noted that he was very upset, and it was difficult for him to keep his composure long enough to speak with them. Still, he managed to tell them what had happened. Mark claimed that he'd already ran his wife's normal route to see if he could find any trace of her, which crossed a creek and explained why his shoes were wet when police arrived. As he was sharing his story, Mark became so overwhelmed that he fell backward against the passenger side of Lori's car. Salt Lake City was already reeling from the kidnapping of 14-year-old Elizabeth Smart only two years earlier in 2002. With this distressing incident in mind, a thorough investigation was immediately launched to find Lori, despite Mark previously believing he had to wait 24 hours. Canine units and helicopters flying low were deployed to help in the search, but over the next few hours, they came up empty-handed. Still, people began coming forward to share their experiences in Memory Grove, with a few different women recalling unsettling interactions with suspicious men in the past. Soon, a disturbing theory emerged that someone may have kidnapped Lori from the area while she was out running, similar to what had happened to Elizabeth Smart. Lori's disappearance was especially distressing because the couple was on the brink of all their dreams coming true. Her and Mark were high school sweethearts and had been married for five years. As Mark had just graduated with a master's in psychology from the University of Utah, the couple had plans to move soon to North Carolina, where Mark had been accepted into medical school to study oncology at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. His father was a pediatrician, and Mark was following in his footsteps, just as one of his brothers had. Lori had even resigned from her beloved job and put her plans for an MBA on hold until Mark finished medical school. Most of their apartment was packed up, and the couple had just celebrated their going-away party three days before her disappearance at a mountain cabin owned by Lori's boss. The couple had even more exciting news, as Lori was about five weeks pregnant, compounding the tragedy of her disappearance. According to friends and family, she was extremely excited about the upcoming move and the baby. By that afternoon, flyers were posted around the city in the hopes that someone had seen what happened to her. However, things became complicated when a neighbor of Lori and Mark's was interviewed. 
This neighbor noted that Lori's car was out in front of the apartment building at 7 a.m., and when she left her house again at 8.30, it was still there. These contrasting witness statements further complicated the investigation. How had she been out for a run and returned home, only to have her vehicle be found again at Memory Grove? With this mystery in mind, investigators turned to Mark to explain. But he couldn't clear up the confusion, as he was certain Lori's car was gone when he woke up. As with most cases, the spouse is the first suspect, but it was hard to understand why Mark would have any motive in Lori's disappearance. Some of Lori's co-workers were interviewed as they were close to the couple. One co-worker stated that she hadn't noticed any change in Lori's behavior recently, which was normally upbeat, and that her relationship with Mark seemed exceptionally happy, especially because he'd sent her flowers at work. Lori's mom confirmed the sentiment, saying that she had a great relationship with Mark and the two adored each other, with Lori calling Mark my big old teddy bear. In fact, everyone who knew the couple believed that they were happily married and deeply in love. Still, Mark had done something a bit odd that morning before he realized Lori was missing. Between 9 and 10 a.m., he'd gone out and purchased a new mattress for their bedroom, presumably for their move. Strange, but it wasn't overly concerning for investigators. Later that afternoon, on the same day that Lori had gone missing, Mark was brought in for a quick interview. On the ride over to the police station, Mark made the comment that Lori is going to be so pissed at me. When asked what he meant, Mark elaborated, saying, If you guys ever find her, she will be so mad at me because I didn't go running with her. Once at the police station, he relayed his story once again to an officer. In your words, what's been going on so far today? Um, my wife got up at five this morning, went running. Um, and I stayed in bed. She, I woke up at eight and she hadn't awakened me when she got home and showered and, and went to work at seven. At least I thought. That's what had happened. When I woke up and she was gone, I just figured she hadn't awakened me, just let me sleep. And so I got up at eight, did some things. I um, played my Nintendo a bit, and we needed a new mattress. We decided to get one, so I went. And we, and we had been shopping around, looking at different places, and I had found one. I mean, okay. What time was that? Uh, I, I left my place at about nine. Okay, what happened if you got the mattress on? I put it on my bed. I was putting sheets on. Called my wife while I was putting sheets on. And someone else answered the phone. But what time is this? About ten. You called wife's cell phone? No. No. Oh. Her, uh, work, work phone? Phone. I was trying to get for a swim in there. Mm, what was the reason for the call? Just to say hi. Okay. I asked to talk to my wife. Well, I don't remember the exact words. Something, he said something along the lines, is, is Lori okay? And I Brandon said... asked you that? Yeah, and I said... I don't know. And, and he told me she hadn't come in. So I went looking for her. Okay, where did you, how did you know where to go look? Because she runs in the same place every day. Initially, Mark had agreed to participate in a CVSA test, also known as computer voice stress analysis which is a controversial technology that tries to measure deception through changes in frequency and stress when someone speaks. Let me explain the, the test to you. So you understand it so you feel comfortable with it and so you won't be afraid of it. Okay. okay. Um, what this is is a truth verification machine. Okay. Have you seen movie? Have you ever had a lie detector test, the old-fashioned type? If you've seen them on TV, okay, they have like the the box and they have all the arms going around, the papers rolling, the guy sitting in the chair and he's all strapped up and all that stuff. And that was developed in the 1930s. 
Okay, we're hoping technology's advanced a little more since then, and that's what this is. Okay, this is just way reform. It's basically saying you're taking this of your own free will. Nobody's forcing you or coercing you or anything of that nature. I, I do feel coerced into taking this. And how do you feel? I mean, let, let me explain this to you. Nobody's making you take this test. If you don't want to, you can walk right out that door. And what happens to me? You walk out the door and they take you back up to your car. And if I refuse, then of course that makes me look guilty. It's not admissible in court anyway. We trust the machine. The courts just don't. It just gives us something to verify the information we've got so far. And obviously, as you, as you said, obviously, we, we, we got some concerns about this mattress thing. We interview people that have killed people all the time, and they don't tell us the truth. And that's what this machine is just for. But at the same time, I've got these circumstances that look bad. So mm -hmm. I feel like if I don't take this, then I'm just going to be drilled. You have nothing to lose by this. I don't think I want to take it. Okay. Investigators thought his behavior was a little curious and decided to take a closer look at the apartment where they lived. Police were dispatched to examine the dumpster in the parking lot outside. There, Mark was joined by one of his brothers, who asked why the police were there, and Mark replied, Apparently they're nervous that I bought a new mattress, followed by, I just need to get away. Yet, despite their suspicion of Mark, officers didn't find anything in the dumpster. While the search for Lori continued, Mark's behavior took another strange turn. Just several hours after Lori went missing, police were called again at 2 a.m. on July 20th to a commotion at a hotel about a half mile from Mark and Lori's apartment. Mark had been staying the night instead of at the apartment. There, he was found running through the hotel completely naked, except for a pair of sandals. Hearing this, his brother Scott arrived at the hotel. There, he found an unexpected message written on Mark's PDA, a handheld computer, reading, To everyone, from Mark. This is justice. I'm so sorry. Following this incident, Mark's family made the decision to check him into a psychiatric unit to receive help. Later, an FBI profiler, Candace DeLong, commented on this incident saying, he kept his shoes on, his sandals, that's not generally something we see in someone truly psychotic. This comment has led some to speculate that Mark may have been trying to play crazy with the intention that he would be hospitalized, and there was a very good reason for him to attempt this. Mark had a secret. Actually, he had many secrets, and they were all about to be uncovered. Mark Hacking had been living a double life. His entire family knew him to be busy and studious, often leaving textbooks open and spread out around the couple's apartment. On more than one occasion, he even had Lori's mother help him to write term papers, all in preparation for his acceptance to medical school. But here's the thing. Despite an imminent move to North Carolina, Mark had never been accepted at the university there. In actuality, he had never even applied or anywhere else. This was especially shocking for his family because Mark had actually traveled across the country to attend fake interviews at multiple medical schools. But this lie was just the first of many. Years of intricately weaved deception slowly began to untangle. Never mind not getting into medical school, Mark had actually dropped out of school altogether and never even graduated from the University of Utah. All the books he had strewn around in the apartment and the term papers he wrote were part of Mark's elaborate attempt to sell his lies. He would even leave the apartment and tell his friends, family, and Lori that he had classes to attend. So, if he wasn't in school like he claimed, where had Mark been spending all of his time? Well, when he was meant to be studying for rigorous medical exams or in class, Mark was often seen hanging out at a store in his neighborhood, drinking soda, eating hot dogs, and smoking. He told the people that worked at the store that he was a therapist and begged them to keep his smoking habit a secret from Lori, as they were part of the Church of Latter-day Saints and weren't supposed to smoke. These weren't his only lies. Mark had told Lori's mother that he worked at the Neuropsychiatric Institute at the University of Utah, where he ran therapy sessions. 
but in reality, he worked as a licensed healthcare assistant and hospital orderly who conducted group activities, not therapy. In an odd story, hospital officials say that at work, Mark wore a shirt tag reading Franz, but claims it wasn't an officially issued name tag. He chose the name from a Saturday Night Live episode featuring a pair of narcissistic bodybuilders. His many lies rocked his and Lori's families, who had all believed that the couple was not only happy, but successful. His own father spoke to the press, as the case still had a chokehold on international news, saying, We didn't see it coming. We got completely blindsided by it. People began to speculate that Mark had fabricated the elaborate lies out of a perceived pressure from his family. His father and brother were doctors, with another brother as an electrical engineer. Mark explained to his family that he'd only lied about his education, which he called misleading people, because it was a little lie that snowballed out of control. Still, he adamantly denied knowing anything about what happened to Lori. Believing him, Lori's family stood by Mark as the search for her continued. It was uncovered that the last time Lori was seen for sure was at a convenience store on Sunday evening, the day before she vanished. She and Mark were spotted on surveillance footage and everything appeared to be fine. The interesting part was that Mark was seen again after 1 a.m. buying cigarettes, but this time there was no sign of Lori. Mark had an explanation. Lori had gone to bed, nothing sinister about that. But still, there was something that wasn't sitting quite right with investigators. The new mattress. As a fan of true crime, you probably thought that was particularly suspicious, and investigators agreed. They soon headed to the church Mark attended and examined the contents of the dumpster there, and they found something. An old, used mattress. Curiously, the top part of the mattress had been cut out and was missing. Mark once again had an explanation, though not for why he'd used the church dumpster instead of the one at his apartment, to dispose of the old mattress. But he claimed that he and Lori had thrown out the old mattress because she had a heavy menstrual cycle and bled on it. Still, that answer didn't quite sit right with investigators, and soon the timeline Mark told about Lori's disappearance was falling apart. Police began to suspect that Lori never even made it out for her morning jog. Even without all of Mark's lies unraveling, the physical evidence wasn't matching Mark's story. Lori's car was closely examined, and it was uncovered that the seat and car mirrors had all been adjusted for someone far larger than Lori, who was about 5'3 and 115 pounds, meaning she wasn't the last person to drive the vehicle. And worst of all, blood was found in the back seat. It was described as a blood transfer stain, which happens when wet blood from one object touches another object. Adding to the growing evidence, investigators took a closer look at the apartment with Mark's permission. Lori's purse, keys, and wallet were found there, further indicating that she had never left to go for her run. As officers searched the bedroom, they uncovered spots of blood on the headboard and on the nightstand. Looking closer at the nightstand, one of the officers opened the drawer and found a sheathed knife. At this discovery, Mark, who was with them the entire time, chuckled nervously. He explained that he had the knife since he was a scout. The officer noticed what appeared to be a spot of blood on the blade and a fingerprint. After this discovery, police sought a warrant to conduct a more thorough search and asked Mark to leave the apartment. It was clear that Mark was a suspect in his wife's disappearance. But still, no one could have predicted that there were even more disturbing secrets yet to be revealed. Everything came crashing down on July 24th, five days after Lori vanished, when Mark's father and brothers confronted him about what happened to her. Lori's relatives soon spoke publicly, asking volunteers to give up the search for her because of the chilling story Mark admitted to his family. It's unclear why Mark decided to come clean at that point, but it's possible with his other lies already exposed, he knew he couldn't hold on to this one any longer. Mark explained that on the evening of July 18th, the couple argued after Lori confronted him about his double life, his many lies, and their impending move. You see, Lori's colleagues recalled that she'd been left in tears on Friday, July 16th, just three days before her disappearance, and the same day of their going away party. They believed that she had contacted someone at the financial aid office at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, to make arrangements for Mark, 
where she was told by a school administrator that there was no record of Mark being enrolled there. The administrator even put Lori on hold and contacted the American Medical College Application Service and confirmed to her that Mark hadn't even applied. Lori had been so upset by the news that she left work early. Still, she arrived at the going away party with Mark as though nothing had happened. That's because Mark had lied to her once again. He told her that he'd spoken to the same administrator and there'd been a mistake with the incoming student list on the computer. None of that was true. Lori had even called the school back and left a voicemail, claiming that Mark had straightened everything out. Lori's voice message wouldn't be heard until Monday, and by then she was already missing. Still, her voice message aired her doubts. She said that she wanted the administrator to call her back and let her know that everything is okay, not that she doesn't trust her husband, but for her own peace of mind. The reason for Lori's skepticism may have been because this wasn't the first time she'd caught Mark in a lie. Lori had once confided in a friend all the way back in 2000 that Mark had lied to her about enrolling for one semester in college. Little did she know that was the tip of the proverbial lie iceberg. She must have suspected that Mark was lying once again because she eventually did confront him. Two different neighbors who lived near the couple came forward, with one saying that she heard loud screams around midnight on the 18th coming from the apartment and the other saying that they heard a male voice shouting, this, it's all over, and that's it. Mark said that Lori eventually went to bed while he stayed up for about an hour playing video games. He then began to go through their packed belongings until he found his 22 rifle and went into the bedroom and shot Lori in the head while she slept. Systematically, Mark disposed of her body, the murder weapon, and the bloody mattress by depositing them in different dumpsters. When Mark was spotted on the convenience store surveillance footage at 1.30 a.m. without Lori, had he been out getting rid of the evidence of her murder, or was he getting ready to commit the sickening deed? In the video, Mark can be seen examining his hands, fingernails, and even checking his watch. Could he have been looking for traces of blood? The next day, he headed out to buy a new mattress, likely hoping that no one would even know the first one had been thrown away before staging another intricate deception, this time Lori's supposed disappearance. Based on his actions and behaviors, Mark sounds like he suffered from narcissistic personality disorder. These individuals tend to present as charming and wonderful until you begin to pull away the layers of the reality they present you with. Once someone begins to confront this individual, they become irate, completely furious that someone would dare to question their word. They also exhibit characteristics such as a pattern of grandiosity and self-importance with a belief that they are special, a need for admiration and expectation of recognition for their superiority, fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love, and a lack of empathy such as being unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. The unimaginable horror of Lori's death was further compounded by the overwhelming question of why. Yes, Lori had caught Mark in his lies, but her family was certain that Lori would have been able to forgive him. Her brother even said of Mark, he didn't have to be a doctor, a president, whatever it was. As long as he was doing his best, she would have loved him. Still, a typewritten note was eventually found in the couple's spare bedroom. It's believed Lori wrote it, but it's unknown exactly when. In the letter she writes, I want to grow old with you, but I can't do it under these conditions. I can't imagine life with you if things don't change. Perhaps this was why Mark killed her, because Lori was threatening to leave him if he didn't change. A forensic psychologist, Dr. Kathy Yates, commented on Mark's possible motives and seemingly pathological lying, saying, as he grew up and was watching other family members get successful or be successful, he was not. There's an element of grandiosity. He felt like he deserved more than he was getting in life, but didn't want to put his energies into achieving the kinds of goals that he probably could have achieved. Mark was arrested on August 2, 2004 on the suspicion of aggravated murder. Even with this confession, there was one integral thing missing, Lori's body. The search headed to the Salt Lake City landfill. For months, there was no sign of her, even with intensive searches utilizing cadaver dogs. That is, until Lori's highly decomposed body was discovered on October 1st. 
almost three months after she'd gone missing. Due to the body's decomposed state, it couldn't be confirmed whether or not Lori was pregnant at the time of her death. Following this discovery, Mark Hacking was sentenced to six years to life in prison. If that short sentence gave you pause, it sounded too lenient to other people as well. However, at the time, this sentence fit the guidelines under Utah law. But due to public outcry, the Utah Board of Pardons and Parole held a hearing to reevaluate Mark's sentencing and ultimately decided that he wouldn't be eligible for parole until 2035. Following this, the sentencing guidelines for aggravated murder was increased to 15 years to life, a law change that has been referred to as Lori's Law in her honor. Eventually, Lori's father had the last name Hacking taken off her headstone, leaving her maiden name, Soros. And though this case seems like it's over, from behind bars, Mark managed to carry on with his shocking behavior. He was caught signing and sending autographs for a site specializing in murder memorabilia. After this was uncovered, Mark agreed to stop, but he still wrote his life history, which has yet to be published. <laughs> 